Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today we're going to go to a Western battlefield during the first year of the Civil War. The day-long conflict in the fields and woods around the Missouri town of Belmont on November 7th, 1861, resulted in a nightmare landscape of carnage and debris. A fire from an abandoned Confederate camp burned by federal forces had spread, leaving in its wake the charred remains of soldiers. Looted baggage and supplies from the camp lay strewn everywhere, intermixed with discarded weapons, equipment, and more bodies of dead and wounded men untouched by the flames, battle smoke still drifting across the field. In the midst of this wreckage, rescue and recovery efforts were underway, and among the hardy souls who scoured the battleground for survivors was a lone woman holding aloft a makeshift flag of truce fashioned from a stick and a handkerchief. Accompanied by a man of color, she distributed supplies to the wounded and made them as comfortable as possible until medical personnel arrived to treat them. She was 29-year-old Mary Jane Safford, later known as the Cairo Angel. A friend of hers, Mary A. Livermore, who became a journalist and a women's rights advocate, described Mary as being, quote, very frail, petite, and figure as a girl of 12 summers and utterly unaccustomed to hardship, end quote. Yet she possessed a remarkable degree of grit and determination and an underlying faith as a universalist that fueled her humanitarian instincts. Mary's base of operations lay a score of miles north from Belmont in Cairo, Illinois, located at the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers in the southernmost tip of the state. The town was flanked by Missouri and Kentucky. Both states had significant populations of pro-slavery secessionists, and their adherence to the Union was an open question. Cairo's strategic value attracted federal army and Navy forces. The first soldiers were ordered in shortly after the surrender of Fort Sumter, and more than 12,000 troops were quartered in the area by June of 1861. Mary was there, and she acted on her own initiative without organizational support to establish a nursing and hospital care center for the rapidly growing soldier population. She was a one-woman relief agency. According to Mary Livermore, quote, she commenced her labors immediately when Cairo was occupied by her troops. If she was not the first woman in the country to enter upon hospital and camp relief, she was certainly the first in the West. There was no system, no organization, no knowledge of what to do, and no means with which to work. As far as possible, she brought order out of chaos, systematized the first rude hospitals, and with her own means, aided by a wealthy brother, furnished necessaries, and when they could be obtained in no other way, end quote. The hospitals that Mary founded were crude, but they were functional. She was, there was mention of her brother, the one who helped Mary's effort. His name was Abner, and he was a prosperous banker in town. There was another brother named Anson, who was a politically active businessman in California, he went on and became the governor of Arizona Territory. All three, the two brothers and Mary, were originally from Hyde Park in Vermont, where they moved to Illinois in the late 1830s when they were just children with their parents. They were looking for a fresh start as farmers in the rapidly growing Midwest. The children went their separate ways after the deaths of their parents in 1848 and 1849. Brother Anson struck out for the gold rush in California. Mary returned to New England for her education, 
lived in Canada for a time, and eventually returned to Illinois and joined her brother, Abner. That's the one who became the banker in Cairo. Meanwhile, word of the crude conditions in Cairo spread as all those soldiers were descending upon the city in those early months of 1861 after Fort Sumter. On June 8th, 1861, as Mary was well underway with her efforts, another woman stepped forward. Her name's also Mary, Marianne Bickerdyke, 54 years old, about more than about 25 years older than Mary, the Cairo angel. Marianne Bickerdyke, she was a widow. She arrived on the scene with medical knowledge and considerable organizational skills. Bickerdyke grew the work started by Mary Safford. Bickerdyke systematized the hospital, first with funds by concerned citizens in her hometown of Galesburg, Illinois, and then later under the auspices of the nonprofit U.S. Sanitary Commission. This relief organization, the Sanitary Commission, was legislated by the federal government only 10 days after Mary Bickerdyke showed up in Cairo. Bickerdyke learned of Mary's efforts after she arrived, and then she found Mary Safford, the Cairo angel, introduced herself, and the two began a long-lasting friendship. These two women, the two Marys, worked side by side, though Bickerdyke, the older, was also the more dominant personality. Bickerdyke reached out to a bunch of officers and others to help make care work in town, and she sought out the senior union officer in the area, an obscure brigadier general which you may have heard of. His name was Ulysses S. Grant. And Mary Bickerdyke formed a working relationship that spanned throughout the war. Mary Safford, who had her own success facing surgeons and officers who were initially hostile to her involvement, also became a friend of Grant. The elder, Mary Bickerdyke, helped develop young Mary's innate abilities and turned her into a proper nurse. Mary Livermore, the other friend, accompanied her on rounds one day. As they entered the first hospital, she observed Mary Safford's routine with patients. She described what she saw, quote, it would be difficult to imagine a more cheery vision than her kindly presence or a sweeter sound than her educated, tender voice as she moved from bed to bed speaking to each one, end quote. Mary Safford carried a basket with her on these visits and from it produced writing paper and ink, newspapers, books, crafting supplies, and other items requested by the bedridden men on earlier visits. Mary carefully recorded each of the requests in a memorandum book, and as quickly as she could get the requests, she delivered them to the men. Mary Livermore, the journalist friend, continued to tell Mary Safford's story. She said, quote, one hospital thoroughly visited, Miss Safford departed, leaving it full of sunshine, despite its rudeness and discomforts, and hastened home, rejoining me in a short time in the next hospital with a fresh installment of baskets and goodies, and so on and so on through the whole number. The visiting done for the day, she hurried home with her filled memorandum book, in which had be, been recorded the wants and wishes for the next day, and she began anew, marketing, purchasing, cooking, packing, and arranging, end quote. Mary Safford made trips to surrounding camps as well. That was partly responsible for that journey to the battlefield of Belmont in November 1861. In fact, this was the first time that she had encountered the wounded from a major battle on the battlefield. A few months after the Battle of Belmont, in February 1862, General Grant successfully captured Fort Donelson, Tennessee, and that resulted in thousands of wounded men and sick men and prompted new relief efforts. 
According to one account, the two Marys, Mary Safford and Mary Bickerdipe, leapt into action with hours of Grant's victory at Donaldson. They boarded steamers hastily outfitted as hospital ships and, in company with fellow nurses, surgeons, and others, traveled up the Cumberland River to care for the injured. As one writer noted, quote, Mary Safford made five trips to Donaldson with the boats, standing in the snow, her slight form whipped by the wind, directing men who, with pick and axe, pried and hacked the wounded out of the mud into which they had frozen fast, end quote. The relentless pace of these events, followed by long days in the Cairo hospitals and a brief stint on a transport ship named the City of Memphis, drove Mary to the brink of collapse. Her health began to fail, and she retired to her brother's home to recuperate. Mary returned in time to participate in more relief efforts following the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing, or Shiloh, on April 6th to 7th, 1862. Her friend Mary Livermore, the journalist, recounted how Mary Safford came to receive her nom de guerre of the Cairo Angel. Quote, she was hailed by dying soldiers who did not know her name, but had seen her at Cairo as the Cairo Angel. She came up with boatload after boatload of sick and wounded soldiers who were taken to hospitals at Cairo, Paducah, St. Louis, etc., cooking all the while for them, dressing wounds, singing to them, and praying with them. She did not undress on the way up from Pittsburgh Landing, but worked incessantly, end quote. Shiloh proved Mary Safford's last battle. Her health was already badly compromised and continued to fail. After her efforts at Shiloh, she suffered a complete physical breakdown and was confined to her bed for months. In the summer of 1862, at the urging of her brother, she embarked on a tour of Europe to recover her health. Her brother paid for it. Mary came home in the autumn of 1866, almost four years in Europe. The following year, in 1867, she entered the New York Medical College for Women and graduated with a homeopathic degree. It was in 1869. Then she went to Europe to study surgery. Coming back to America in 1872, she then joined the faculty of the Boston University School of Medicine as a professor of gynecology. Like other leading women of her time, she embraced a reformist agenda. She supported the suffrage movement, campaigned against heavy dresses and tight lacing as a health hazard. She also embraced a doctrine of free love. She was also active in the Women's Educational and Industrial Union, an organization founded to help needy working class women and children in Boston. In 1886, Mary's health began to fail again and prompted her retirement. She moved to Tarpon Springs, Florida to regain her health, but she was already in decline. She passed away in 1891 at 56 years old. You can't help but imagine her life was cut short by her service during the war. She was survived by two young girls she had adopted and by an ex-husband named Gorman Blake, to whom she was married from 1872 to 1880. Mary's early demise was not a surprise to those who knew her, and they blamed her passing, her early passing, on the war. Her death was met with sorrow, even though they knew that she was in trouble with her health. Her hometown newspaper observed, quote, Years came and went, leaving their traces in her face, but through it all shone the light of love, the cheery spirit that never knew defeat. So there you have the story of Mary Safford, the Cairo angel who helped uncounted numbers of soldiers during the battles of Belmont 
Fort Donaldson and Shiloh. Thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.